In this series of videos, I'll be giving you an introduction to machine learning. So what exactly is machine learning? There are a lot of different definitions out there, uh, but I think put simply, machine learning refers to a number of different algorithms that can learn a representation of data. And when people try to learn a representation of data, they typically have some kind of an objective in mind. The three most common types of machine learning objectives are unsupervised machine learning, supervised machine learning, and reinforcement learning. And we'll talk through each of these and talk about kind of what is the overall goal uh, of each of these different types of machine learning. In this course, we're really gonna be focusing only on supervised machine learning, but it's useful to understand that machine learning can be used for objectives that are outside of the scope of this class. And even these three examples here uh, provide a little bit of a simplistic view of things. There are other types of objectives uh, that I have left out from this slide. When people talk about unsupervised learning, they'll sometimes say informally that they want to find patterns in the data. And what they're typically talking about when they say something like that is that they want to either perform clustering or reduce the dimensionality of the data. They typically don't have any kind of outcome in mind that they want to predict. They may just have a series of you know, variables and they want to see how those variables and patients uh, or cases are interrelated. So one type of an unsupervised learning objectives that uh, you'll commonly come across is clustering, where the objective is to identify similar rows in a data set. So you could imagine how if your data set only has three columns, uh, that you could scan through your data and probably identify clusters yourself uh, without even needing an algorithm. Like, you know, you've got, uh, let's say, age, you've got uh, presence of hypertension, presence of diabetes. Well, you could probably find, you know, if I told you to find three or four clusters, you could probably go through and identify different clusters that represent, you know, combinations of uh, older age, hypertension, and diabetes, maybe younger age in the absence of either hypertension and diabetes, and maybe a third cluster that has kind of some mix of those three variables. However, when you have a thousand variables, let's say, uh, clustering is a lot more difficult because you know, there are almost uh, too many variables for you to scan manually. So clustering algorithms aim to clump or group patients together that are similar to each other based on a combination of uh, their variables. Another type of unsupervised learning task is called dimensionality reduction. And unlike clustering, which was focused on identifying similar rows, this is really about uh, learning a representation of data that requires fewer variables. So if my data set um, has a thousand variables and many of those variables are similar to each other, I may want to learn some representation of my data that only involves maybe you know a handful of variables. Um, and when people are you know looking at these massive data sets, it's not uncommon to want to plot data, you know, plot those data sets uh, on two axes, uh, an x and a y axis. So many of the dimensionality reduction uh, uh, algorithms are really focused on allowing you to more easily visualize data that has a lot of different columns where you can't plot all of the columns at once. So here are some examples of unsupervised learning. Uh, this is an example of clustering. So let's say you've got uh, patients who have uh, different types of asthma. They may have non-allergic asthma or allergic asthma. They may have different uh, ages of asthma onset. Uh, and then they may have asthma that's currently inactive or is currently active. And if you've got, you know, different combinations of these patients and you've got kind of a point cloud where you can see that there are clusters of points, you might apply a clustering algorithm to uncover different phenotypes of asthma with the thought being that potentially uh, these phenotypes, uh, you know, 
not only present differently, but may have different uh, treatment plans that make sense for them. So this is an example of a paper that you know, identified four phenotypes um, that they labeled A, B, C, D that represent different combinations of the age of onset of asthma and the current level of activity. Another thing you can use clustering for is to identify uh, trajectories of disease. So you could imagine how, you know, there might be patients who have very minimal disease, patients who have moderate disease, and patients who have severe disease, and that you're tracking this, uh, you know, score of their disease over time, uh, let's say over a four or five year period. In this case, uh, the analysis uh, that I did here uh, identified three different clusters. There were people with kind of very stable mild disease or mild symptoms, uh, kind of another cluster with moderate symptoms, and then a cluster with kind of more extreme symptoms. Um, I was hoping to find clusters of patients that had kind of a, a gradual worsening or a gradual improvement of symptoms, um, but the clustering algorithm didn't identify anything like that. But that's a reason why you might use clustering is to naturally define different trajectories um, of an illness over time or of a symptom over time. Here's an example of dimensionality reduction combined with clustering. So this comes from a paper that looks at uh, folks who are uh, tweeting about uh, cigarette smoking. And so they try to figure out, is there anything in common uh, about these you know, people who are tweeting about smoking? And so they thought that they could look at several different characteristics uh, of the uh, folks doing the tweeting. So they were going to look at how many original tweets do those uh, people have? Uh, how many hashtags do they use? How many mentions do they have? And so on. And the idea was that, you know, for spam accounts uh, where they're trying to get you to either, you know, smoke or quit smoking, that you'd be coming across certain types of patterns in the, you know, uh, timing and, and content of the tweets that would allow you to make a determination as to whether this is uh, a spam tweet or coming from someone who's an expert. So what they did was they didn't know, you know, ahead of time uh, which tweets were coming from experts and which tweets were coming from, you know, marketers, etc. They ran a dimensionality algorithm um, and then divided it into clusters. And they were able to demonstrate that the clusters learned by their you know, dimensionality reduction algorithm actually uh, paired fairly nicely with the uh, mechanism or the uh, type of person doing the tweeting. So for example, you can see that the uh, blue dots here represent individuals, whereas the uh, gray dots towards the right uh, and along the bottom represent uh, spammers. Supervised learning is kind of what I would say is the most common form of machine learning that you come across, especially in healthcare. And supervised learning really involves predicting an outcome using data. So even within this kind of broad uh, objective, this kind of gets broken down into more simple or, uh, or kind of uh, more granular objectives. The first objective is classification, where the outcome that you are trying to predict is a binary outcome or a categorical outcome with multiple categories. There is a term uh, called regression in supervised learning that refers, refers to an objective where you're trying to predict an outcome that is numeric. Notice that this is a very different use of the word regression than is commonly found in kind of epidemiology or statistical modeling where it refers to uh, a specific type of model known as either linear or logistic regression. And finally, survival outcomes refer to a combination of two variables. One is a status variable that's binary commonly, 
and one is a time to event variable. Um, and these are you know, commonly used to try to predict or uh, distinguish between patients who are gonna have an event in the near future uh, and distinguish those from individuals who are gonna have that event much later uh, in the future versus individuals who aren't gonna have that event at all. So here's an example of uh, supervised learning. Let's say you have a 50-year-old man with high-risk prostate cancer and that individual undergoes surgery then you come across an 80-year-old man with high-risk prostate cancer and that individual undergoes radiation. You then have another 80-year-old man in your data set who uh, has high-risk prostate cancer who undergoes uh, surgery to remove the prostate. And then you have a 50-year-old man with favorable risk prostate cancer who gets put on active surveillance. So if you were given just those four rows of data and learned a model from that, and then someone asked you, I have a, another patient who's 80, year, 80 years old with high-risk prostate cancer. You know, what would you want your model to say? Now, in this case, we have you know, kind of very limited examples, so we might want our model to actually not say anything. But let's say that you know, we had to have our model say something. I would say that based on this data, what we would expect our model to say is that there's a 50% chance that this patient uh, is going to get radiation uh, and a 50% chance that this patient is going to get surgery. And if we wanted to operationalize that, um, we could you know, make this tool available to patients. So this is a tool that we developed using data from a statewide registry uh, in the state of Michigan, where patients can enter information about their, you know, their age and the characteristics of their uh, prostate cancer, and they can, using a machine learning model, get feedback on what similar patients chose uh, for treatment. So you can see how this patient who's 66 with a relatively low PSA, prostate-specific antigen, uh, and a low Gleason score, which puts them at lower risk, would have a two-thirds likelihood of being uh, put on active surveillance based on similar data, uh, patients in our registry.